Yes, we live uh, in an interconnected world. We live uh, in the digital age. By means uh, of uh, digitalization, we are expanding our knowledge. We are climbing uh, somehow new mountains and experiencing new emotions whenever we surf the digital world. A famous expert of artificial intelligence and complexity, Mario Rossetti, however, recently remembered me that in the mountains, fear kills more than courage. What form, uh, therefore, does fear and courage take uh, in the digital age? Some of us here are probably too young uh, to perceive the danger. Some of us are not sufficiently young, perhaps, to dare enough. Mario Rossetti, however, pointed out that nowadays, human beings generate about 10,000 billion gigabytes per year, with doubling time of one year. This doubling time is going to drop down to 12 hours very soon, in a few years. Therefore, despite the clear impression that the digital age is endowing us with great opportunities. There is a widespread sense of fear that such technological power can trap us in a world we cannot further control by changing our values, perceptions, imaginaries, feelings. At the same time with the COVID, we also learned that such digital power can enhance our capability to learn, to meet, to share ideas, to feel for others, and to converge on new collective behaviors to protect us all, think of the social distance. As far as we have been able to adopt the us perspective, we generated new virtues and healthy processes and initiatives. Expressions like, you don't save yourself alone, we are in the same boat, disclose an undeniable truth. However, as it goes, this double scenario entails a risk. Such a risk relates to managing new challenges and implementing new solutions from the machine paradigm within the same paradigm, which is extractive. We have to remember, in fact, that computers, smartphones, personal assistants such as Alexa, social media and so forth, extract data and information, then convey them to us, thus extracting again our attention, feelings, money, time. This may entail, of course, a fascinating human journey, in as much as a pure nightmare. We need to recharge, but we cannot miss the target and ourselves in the effort. Thus, the question is whether a digital humanity can be an option or just a paradox. Let's think that we invented machines to extract materials, energies, information, in those situations where we were no further able or willing to make use of our physical capabilities and to expand our autonomy and connections beyond any expectation. Nevertheless, as this iconic image shows, while replacing human work with machines, we started experiencing anxiety and concerns too. We can be, in fact, but one more mechanism in a chain of processes, replaceable and constantly challenged by other machines that sooner or later will be able to dictate us how to live, how to sleep, what to eat, when to rest, whom to marry. Quite often, 
even, we even measure ourselves and others sometimes in functional mechanistic terms. Think, for example, when I think that I'm okay, I'm fine, if I have a, a certain performance at school, at work, in the gym, with my friends, even with my beloved ones. We clearly enter an age in which the digital world might well appear as a unified crowd of people perfectly synchronized and connected in as much as anonymized, despite the self-perception of being in control of their image, their feelings, their relationships. Then, a new level of extraction emerges. Let's call it uh, homogenization by identity extraction. Machines are extractive and perform through an extractive logic by definition, even when they seem to recharge us, to recharge us. They need data, energy, but they cannot do all that without us. We thus have an option, more technology, more humanity, or the other way around. We can follow the same machine paradigm, functionally extracting energy from others, from ourselves, in terms of work, programs, sport, pressures, from the environment in terms of natural resources, while expecting, for example, the institutions to work out a solution for everything for us. Or we can mind the gap and bridge the river by changing the paradigm. Here is my proposal, therefore. Let's consider a very simple, sometimes obvious, and yet not trivial dimension of our existence, which is unknown to machines. Not all of us are, in fact, engineers, journalists, <laughs> professors, sisters, brothers, mothers or fathers. But we all are sons or daughters, children of somebody else. We are, therefore, numerators of a wider and common denominator, which makes us human. It consists of our natural world, of our cultures, values, languages. We belong to a community, to an environment. We have a biography. By birth, by choice, sometimes by chance. With the pandemic, we rediscovered that we depend on each other, that we will survive only as a community, biologically, mathematically, philosophically speaking. This means that we live in relation. We understand the world in relation. We flourish in relation. Generating sustainable relationship. We even generate meaning and values by relating and judging what is relevant in different circumstances. Therefore, extracting versus generating paradigms. You can ask, is it a metaphor or a mathematical tool? It doesn't matter. The Aristotelian concept of difference teaches us that no living entity can recharge and properly grow without a continuous effort of combining such a relationship between numerators and denominators. Our being different, not just diverse, is a relational concept. Sometimes in the human world we are not unique, diverse, in the digital sense, but we are not alone either. Our being alive results from our capability to conjugate our best different numerator with the common denominators. But also from the courage and proudness of contributing 
to enlarging the denominators. How? By cultivating enabling factors, differences, avoiding inequalities. This is just an apparent paradox. We have to work on the denominators, enlarging them as much as possible to make them capable of holding a higher number of numerators or the colors and shadows of life. Both in developing and developed countries, however, there is a real risk to lose such social bonding, which depends on the progressive crumbling of our identity as individuals and as a society as a whole. If people stop believing that they have a real ability to do things together, there is nothing that policy, for example, can do to this respect, in this respect. Shall we resign ourselves to this scenario? Let's find a simple answer. Simplicity in complexity by surfing our humanity again. This image embodies a story and goes by a name, Jose. Jose was a child that we met in Guatemala. We were working there in a social and research program with undergraduate students. One of them, Sarah, spent a lot of time cleaning the feet of the children in the village. They used to work barefoot, not having shoes. And their feet, they were often wounded and the wounds got infectious. One day, Sarah thought of getting Jose distracted during that painful operation by means of her MP3. The child enjoyed it so much that it took a shorter time to conclude that painful operation and to equip him with new sneakers. When leaving the village on the last day of our program, many people showed up to say goodbye. Sara saw Jose in the middle of a group of families and approached him. She offered him her MP3 and asked the kid whether he would have been happy to get it as a farewell gift. Jose looked at her, smiled, and answered, No, thank you. You keep it. With this, I cannot play with my brother. This is what humanity is all about. Having or not having a MP3 does not make a huge difference, whereas cultivating my relationships truly does and let me enjoy what makes me a numerator of such a rich and powerful denominator that is the human community. Let's make, therefore, an effort not to leave anybody behind and nothing will ever deprive us of such a power. That is the possibility to make decisions by shaping our lives and our world. There enough to be different by generating commons and relational goods. For example, care for your home, invest on common programs and aims, contribute to your university or country growth and counting. This is a prerequisite to unleash the power of social bonding and to develop a caring economy too. We should not therefore use the COVID situation as an excuse to justify a period of stagnation. Rather, the COVID emergency endowed us with the option of moving towards a different normality, a normality of social practices based on affective interactions and not on mere functional, economic, quite often digital transactions. All these affective interactions will unleash a new age of human flourishing by generating wider denominators and richer numerators at the same time. You, me, each 
and every one of us.